Good morning. Oh, it's good to be here. You know, I, uh, I realized this morning, and Ben, let's give Ben another big hand. I mean, that was just incredible. <laughs> I realized that uh, when he was talking about appreciation, I was feeling rather emotional this morning. <laughs> so, especially to think he was dancing to thank all of you. Wow. You know, this is, a, uh, this is a great event. We have grown by about 30% a year. Originally, we started talking about the School Improvement Innovation Summit. We didn't want to do an event. In fact, it's, it uh, has come up a few times. You'll hear from Curtis tomorrow. Curtis and I talked about it for years. And I said, it's nuts. It's a waste of money. It's, okay, it's a ton of money. I don't know if it's a total waste of money, but... <laughs> You know, it, it, and so five years ago, we started to think this is real. Uh, Corey, one of the other brothers, was also a big part of that conversation. And, and uh, we realized that we couldn't find an event that wasn't about education investment that was called an Innovation Summit. There is one of those. There's policy maker innovation education things. I think that's where all this federal policy comes from that forces everybody to be compliant. So whoever's at those events, I don't know. I can't find anybody that's going to them, but I know they're out there. I've heard about them. Uh, and then there's, of course, events for parents. There are events for all of, all of us that are involved in education. But there wasn't anything that really focused on innovations in education that were practical, real, scalable, effective, that really everybody in the world ought to know about. So we started the School Improvement Innovation Summit. That took two years to get to that point. And a whole lot of dialogue before. But here we are, our third event. How many were, you, were you here last year or the year before? Can I see some hands? I know we have some repeat, I was going to say repeat offenders, wrong audience, sorry. But uh, we really appreciate you being here. Uh, this is an event that we hope that you walk away from with new knowledge, validation for some of the crazy things that people may have thought that you're doing that you know are right. You're going to hear from experts. You're going to hear from experts that are practitioners. You're going to hear from great practitioners that are experts. So a lot of, uh, you're going to hear a lot of wonderful, and see wonderful things and be able to participate in some great sessions. Um, ben had, uh, you saw Alyssa's name up here as well, his, uh, I believe, competitive dance partner who will be up. I think you're gonna, we're going to see more tomorrow. So just so you know, that was not a mistake. And uh, just in case you have that question, we'll try to answer all of your questions. Maybe not here when I'm, when I'm up. But uh, again, we appreciate all of you being here. We need to give a big thanks now, and I'll do it again tomorrow, to all of, could all, anyone that has, that's involved with School Improvement Network, just raise your hands or stand up if you're not. There are a lot of people that are here that have pulled, put this together. I um, mean, when you see them or see their name tags, if it's good, thank them. If it's bad and you're frustrated, tell them, and, or chase me down. We want to know. We want to make it better. By the way, the last thing that I'll mention, we'd love feedback on as well, we have had a tremendous amount uh, for the, now the third year of people saying, please let us know when we can go learn more about products. We've always been really sensitive to have just a sales event. That's not what we're about. We're about 100%, just like the video said. We've realized that we can help make 100% ha happen with all of us combined together. 100% of students being truly ready for college and or career when they leave high school. It's doable. It's possible. We've got the data to back it up. Not just one study, but multiple studies. I think a lot of you are here because you know those things or you want to learn those things. And so it, it's, it's very real. And so as we do this and talk about things, we've added some things this year. I'll be back up here later this morning to talk a little bit about product. And we've got breakouts for those as well. I mentioned the thing we'll do next year, the new event. We'll be doing regional user group conferences. The first one we will do will be in September in Georgia. You'll hear about other locations so that your other teachers, your peers, other administrators can attend close by and not have to come to Salt Lake. We'll also be doing a big thought leadership event probably in D.C. later in the fall next year so that we can get, and you'll hear me talk more this morning about policymakers, business leaders, parents, administrators, teachers, all together in the same room in a place where we hope it can have impact, where there aren't any events like this 
that we're able to find there. So watch uh, the news from us. Check your emails periodically, and we'll keep you updated on those things. Today, I'd like to... Uh, we, started, we decided we would talk about or start differently. We invited uh, Benjamin up as now a former student, um, as now that he's graduated, to start off not just hearing from the, same, the, the blither from the CEO of the organization, but to think differently. Little did you know you were going to get a little extra exercise. And here I am, white boy in the audience thinking, all right, now I can dance. And then he blows, burst my bubble. Nope, that's not dancing. So I don't know what I'm going to do. I was all ready for this. I, hey, that's a geometry thing. I remember, maybe that did have value. There's a point. Anyway, but uh, change happens. So we wanted to mix it up a little bit and, and really get somebody that was a lot more engaging than me. But you know, there are things that are really driving our nation right now and the globe. So a big question I have asked myself a tremendous amount the last two years, have we been in an economic crunch or has it been an education crunch? What does that really mean? For those of you who aren't aware, we have over 2 million people in the United States right now, or excuse me, 2 million jobs in the United States right now that can't be filled. 2 million. These are jobs that pay over $80,000 a year. This is quite significant to me. We don't have... We have workers now. There were 5 million people pre-recession that have had very difficult times finding jobs. And yet we have 2 million that are, that are available. You know, in Utah, we have, we, we, uh, we struggle with software developers. There are two jobs to every one developer in the state. Now, this is, it really helps with the whole national issue. It's one of the big pieces in the whole immigration issue is trying to allow more workers to stay that get educated here, not to go down that road. So we have students that are graduating from high school more than ever before in the history of our country, but they don't have the skills to step into these jobs, or now, as we know, they're being remediated when they their first year of college. And we also have 50% of our college graduates that aren't ready either. When they, they're not ready to be hired. They don't have the skills, so they're unemployed or underemployed. You know, they're working at McDonald's or wherever they can get a job. So it's a big issue. So that, in thinking through this process, it takes me back. Okay, so what's happened? And I'm going to share with you a lot of different slides and information that I've received over the last year to hopefully help. So as we look back in time, 150 years ago when we traveled across the country, it was usually in a coach, on a horse, or on foot. What do we do today? We jump in a plane, right? Okay, we'd all probably like to have one like that. But, uh, but we do. We get on a plane. Most of you are from out of state. We, it's easy. I was in Orlando yesterday. In fact, for four days, I kept thinking, gosh, if I could just get to the summit, I could relax. So I was at the park, yes, with the family, and, and it was a blast, but okay, sidebar. All right, Silicon Valley 100 years ago, orchards, right? Today, we hear Silicon Valley, what do we think about? Facebook, all the, the big tech companies. Crazy things have gone on, not only in the U.S., but now we're seeing these hubs develop in Sao Paulo, Shanghai, Mumbai, Dubai, and all over the world. So really, what used to be the Silicon Valley, which was this hub of technological and entrepreneurial innovation, has really turned into a global. It is global. So when you hear this, those, those PISA scores that kind of drive us all a little bit crazy about how terrible we may be doing as a nation, it's important to realize that we are truly global now. There is so much going on that is so important not only to, as we hear politicians say, to our country, but really to our students, to our, their economic structure, their opportunities, what they're able to do. So we are living in exponential times. And to share some of that, I want to bring out some of the things that usually come up in the investor meetings of those groups that are looking at investing in education. First off, the internet. By the way, how many of you are on the, in the internet or are on the internet in 1996? Can I see hands? All right. We had our first site in 1994. I thought we were so far behind the eight ball, but uh, we weren't. 16 million people in 1996, almost 3 billion on the internet this year. Amazing growth. Mobile phone subscribers globally, there are 6 billion. Almost 87% of the world has access. So those phones will text if they're not smartphones. There are amazing things that are going on. The, the expectation is by next year, Mobile usage will surpass desktop usage. So as people access. So as educators, what does that mean with students? Do we have to think about things differently? What else is going on? Well, there's some of these companies that you may or may not have heard of. Pinterest. How many have Pinterest accounts in here? All right. We've got six men. <laughs> 
I raised my hand just to get you two. I don't yet. So, then I should. I know I can only get away with that maybe for a few more months. And I've offended everybody else, all, every, most of the guys that work, for, work with me. So, Pinterest started in, in 2011. There's 49 million subscribers. Think about these numbers. Dropbox, uh, Dropbox, 100, over 100 million. Yeah, me too. Instagram, how many hands? Let's stick them up there. You know, I Instagrammed like crazy this week in Orlando. 100 plus, over 100 million. LinkedIn, how many on LinkedIn? 225 million users. LinkedIn was a little slow, it's gone crazy. They changed the rules. You don't have to say I'm your friend anymore, you know me, you can just accept me. So um, anyway, Twitter, 500, over 500 million. Half a billion people. Skype, how many of you Skype? How many of you Skype internationally? A few, yeah, a lot of hands. The price is great, right? 663 million people. YouTube, this number says a billion plus. Do you know they have a billion unique visitors a month? That's amazing. And I'm sure a lot of that billion is the same billion every single month. But Facebook, we know 1.1 1, 1. 1 billion. This, these are just mind-blowing. Now, it's not just U.S. companies. All of those groups started in the U.S. Well, predominantly. We have, uh, oops, groups, that, you know, a big, a huge community in Russia, huge community in India, huge communities in China. We just shared a few. Billions of people are participating in doing things online. And what's significant about this? None of these companies existed before 9-11. Most of us in this room, except for a few of the students were, that are here, were, we were out of college in, when 9-11 hit, right? Most of us. There are a few young ones in the audience. So this is, these are radical changes that we kind of take for granted. But to the students of the world, they're living in this space. Another big thing, of course, computers. I, I have a I've got 20 minutes I'm not gonna, I, to, that I could talk about this, I won't. ENIAC, this huge supercomputer. First one, 1943, 1,800 square feet, 27 tons, over $6 million. And then what happened in this evolutionary process? DEC released the mini computer. Uh, there was a CEO that said, there's no market. For, in fact, the IBM CEO, who was before, right before this time, said there's about a market for computers of about five. Five people could probably use them. Um, of course, IBM later released the PC, and of course, the iPhone's out now. It's twice as powerful as that $6 million computer. We know how much it weighs. We know the size. Um, significantly, the iPad was released. The reason, this is not an Apple advertisement, but what blows my mind is the 500 million iOS devices, Apple devices that have now been sold in a little over five years. And how many of you have students or yourselves that have access to these devices or similar devices. It's not just Apple. There's all these Android-based platforms. It's changed the way we do things. And it's very important to remember. So now, as we shift from what's happening out there in the world, what about education evolution? So I don't know if this scenario looks familiar. This is a classroom setting from the 14th century. So Henry of Germany was delivering so I, you'll notice the students in the back chit-chatting in the upper corner. And I thought that was a photo of me. So, I re, no, 1350, that's not. Okay, Victorian ed, things began to change a little bit. See, the classroom structure is vastly different. They began to use slates. Uh, I found an Egyptian picture with papyrus. They didn't throw that in. Today's classroom, you can see they have a smart board. Um, incidentally, I was talking to a group and we were, were going through this. I said, you know, the classroom structure has also been around for thousands of years. I think the size will change. We'll see more collaboration, but we're still going to have kids raise their hands. We're still going to teach them to be respectful. But that general structure, in o overwhelmingly in most kind of classrooms I walk into, has not changed for a thousand years. This is some cause for concern. Keep in mind, we just talked about all these huge evolutionary things that are going on that can literally change what happens in the classroom. So the big question is, is education keeping up at the rate of change everything else is? We're going to answer that. Well, the reality is there's a rapidity that is, things are changing so rapidly that we need to be aware of it. And what I've realized in groups that I've spoken to in the last few months is that most people are not aware. First off, how many of you are aware of Khan Academy? Of course, you're, I'm going to see a lot of hands. How many of you are teachers that use Khan Academy as part of your curriculum? 
We have about 10 hands that went up. So interesting, we ought to think about that. 240 math lessons were delivered last year, or have been delivered, excuse me. I've got some just data. No, which is a, a book, an ebook, 6,000 universities, over 200,000 titles, ePals. How many have ePals, or have students that have, I should say? A few. Over a million classrooms in over 200 countries. Newton, 50 million users, rapidly growing company. 2U, which is a, a company that helps provide online courses for universities. Over $230 million have been paid to universities and tuition to their partnerships. 1,100 courses delivered per week. Dreambox delivered over 65 million courses last year. How many are familiar with Dreambox? A few. So there's a lot going on in our space. Edmodo, 18.7 million users. That's uh, CAGR, that's compounded annual growth rate. So they're growing very rapidly, 170% a year on average. edX, how many are familiar with edX? Or MOOCs, how many have heard of MOOCs? All right, put your seatbelts on. Serious. Um, MOOCs are growing rapidly. I, I, in fact, let's go to Coursera. edX and Coursera are competitive products, but they're free. Um, edX was developed by Harvard, MIT, Texas, the T Texas State University system was part of edX. Coursera was a group of Stanford uh, University professors, Stanford professors. 83 universities are now part of Coursera. 16 countries, 4.1 million students. In March, they had 3.3 million students. These courses are free. They have over 393 now. They are the, the, the goal behind Coursera is let's have the best professors from the best schools with the best classes that are engaging, and let's watch and see what goes on. Let's look at the data. So now if we have students that don't get a question right, they literally can look at two or 3,000 students that got it wrong and figure out what was wrong with the question and what was wrong with the curriculum. So it's changing what's happening, and, we're, and it's a great opportunity. We're seeing school systems that are now thinking about, we could use MOOCs as part of our curriculum. The state of Utah passed a law, Senate Bill 65, two years ago, in which high schools could actually, high school students could sign up for an online course, take the course, get credit for it, and the dollars that would normally go to that high school would go directly to a provider. I think it's $734. So right out of the school's budget. They didn't have to approve any funding. The funding was already approved. So there, and there are a lot of states that are considering doing similar things. Now, that's not bad. We want to increase opportunities for students, but we also want to make sure that they're very sound, great learning experiences. Uh, School Improvement Network. I don't know if you, how many of you have heard of this organization. They're great. Uh, almost 9 million viewings. This is very focused on professional learning, very different from a lot of the very broad-based student products. Over 760,000 hours of professional learning has occurred, and it should say view, has been viewed. So lots of activity. Google, two billion education searches per month, um, six billion per day, Inter you know, and those are education specific. Classrooms are becoming more collaborative. We're seeing these big changes. You know, the, the, uh, in, the, in the business environment, a year ago, I was sitting in a session, in fact, it was about eight months ago, hearing several executives globally talk about what they're doing in their environments. It was amazing to me what they were saying. We need, uh, our, our environments need to be collaborative. We want our employees to think entrepreneurially. We want them to be able to be adaptable. We want them to communicate with each other. They need to be articulate. And we want to give them a lot of flexibility. Uh, those word, do those words sound familiar? We talked about having kids be able to do the same things. Yeah, we've been talking about this for a decade, maybe, well, probably 20 years or more. Well, it's here. It's actually upon us. So this environment is already in the workplace. We have oh, several dozen positions that didn't exist 10 years ago. And, there, and all of that talk that we heard, hey, we're teaching kids about jobs. These students need to be prepared for jobs that don't even exist. Those days are here. Those companies, there, there will be companies. In fact, uh, David Huell, a futurist, mentioned over the next decade, we're going to see more changes than we've seen in the last 35 years at the beginning of this technological revolution when it really began. We'll see more things happen in the next decade than we've seen in the last 35. And that's been crazy to me. And it's wonderful that we get to live through it. So classrooms are becoming more collaborative. Teachers are, being, are really shifting from teacher 
to teacher as facilitator. We're seeing environments truly become more student-centered student in the approach. By the way, you're going to be able to learn about all of these things. So today's learners have changed as well. I think many of you have heard this multiple times. We know they're digital natives. We know they cannot remember a time the internet, that they didn't have the internet. I mean, most kids aren't going to remember a time they didn't have Instagram and Facebook and all those other things. They're just part of their life. And remember, they carry knowledge in the palm of their hand. How many of us, how many dinner parties have been changed forever from the guy that showed up that knew everything? <laughs> oh, really? The Civil War did what? What did Robert E. Lee do? Well, let me just pull that out and check it on Google. No, as a matter of fact. So things have changed. But it has the learning environment. These learners, again, oh, excuse me, these learners, they read messages. You know, they read the messages that are sent to them if they're texted. I don't get to the 300 emails I get sent. I just pray I don't miss the important ones. But, but incidentally, uh, young women, girls text about 4,400 messages a month. Young men, about 3,400. A little bit of trivia for you. The other important piece is that they can publish anytime they want to the world. They can share it with anybody they want. You know, I've realized my daughters who Instagram like just an amazing amount only Instagram to a small group. They don't share it with everybody, but they can. And, and so the choice is there. So we, we know that it's really important. It's critically important we figure out how do we create these environments in schools? How do we help these students who desire so badly to influence the world and have impact? You know, but I haven't heard anybody say, why do kids want to do this? Why do they want to be collaborative? Why do they want to change the world? They communicate with the globe. They already do. It's not a matter of, well, gosh, if we could just get them to do that. They do it anyway. My son can jump on Xbox and play with somebody else in England or India or Japan or China or any place. It's already here. So we need to make sure that we are teaching kids these skills that I've mentioned, that they're able to think critically, they're able to be adaptable. They're, they're, really, they're truly lifelong learners and they, they have a hunger for learning, that they can communicate, they collaborate, they can work across networks. So we know these things are important, but what's the solution? How do we pull all these things together? How do we keep in mind all of this stuff that's going on around us with all of these companies that are going fast, these jobs that are being created, the challenges that are there and really make a difference in the schools, in the environments, in the classrooms where we are, what we've realized is that 21st century teachers are the key. They are the solution. I was flying back from Kuala Lumpur last fall from another education event, and it hit me on the plane. How, I was asking this question, how do we help people get this? And the key is teachers are the creators of our workforce. It's the teacher I was mentioned this to somebody in our office. I said, what do you think of this? They said, oh, you know, it's parents. I said, no. Parents want to, hopefully you're teaching their kids values and ethics and how to be and how to act and respect and all those things, which we're teaching in school as well, a lot of places. But I said, it's when we really need to learn, if I want to learn how to be a doctor or a software developer, I go to school. It's a teacher that's going to teach me. And we forget often, we being everybody else. Uh, so it's really critical that as we think about 21st century teachers, that we make sure that we create those environments and provide the tools and resources to help them truly become that. That they're highly effective, highly engaging, that they focus on learning and thinking and meeting the needs of every student to help them differentiate. BYOD is not a bad term. How many are familiar with BYOD? Bring your own device, bring your own technology. You know, we have school boards, other groups I've met with that have said, gosh, we've got to do that but our school board won't allow it. Well, then we need a policy change, probably. And you can save a lot of money. Uh, anyway, that's, but that's a, it's a, it's, this is very real. So the rate of change, how do we close that gap? Well, the reality is, we believe as an organization, the key is through highly effective teachers and, that are focused on developing lifelong learners. And every student can really be, they really, truly can be successful. So what do these highly effective teachers do? Well, we know that they understand what effective really means, that it's all about 100%, that they believe every student can be successful. They have high expectations for every learner, regardless of where they're from, regardless of what they look like. They create environments that are engaging, that are relevant, that are exciting. But then the big question is, well, how do we deal with all this stuff? How do we actually implement it? Where do we go? Well, folks, you've come to the right place. So, 
That's what the summit's all about. We really hope that you're able to answer some of these questions. We know, I know that you've heard a lot of the last part of this presentation before. But the big gap is often, how do we implement these things in our classrooms or in our schools, in our school district or across our state? Can we really do it? Well, you can. And you can learn a tremendous amount while you're here. This morning after me, we're going, following me, we'll have uh, Sonja Alexander come up and uh, Aaliyah Henderson-Rosser. We're going to talk about online professional development and what they did in their school system. Following them, we'll hear from Alan November, who will talk about, he, he, he's an expert on learning and 21st century learning. And hopefully he'll push everybody's buttons just a little bit with some great questions. But you'll, and you're going to learn a lot more about new teacher standards. What do things look like? What are some of the opportunities that are out there? And you'll probably be stuck hearing from me a couple of times. But the most important piece, making 100% happen. That is what we're about. And we hope that you can join us in our cause of truly making 100% happen. That you can believe that it's possible. That you can see solutions and understand that it really is, oh, there's me, I did that. Anyway, I hope that you can join us, that you can see ways to do these things, that this just is not a lovely event where you're able to give up a few of your summer days and spend a lot of time meeting wonderful people, but you're able to get some great ideas of things you can take back and implement in your classroom or your school or your district or your state or with your friends or wherever it is and truly make 100% happen. Thank you.